It's good to see you all today. It's good to have a visitors here today. And I just want to say that I'm not the regular speaker, but hopefully if you bear with me, it'll be all right. We'll make it through. And if you talk to some of the folks here, I sometimes have a little bit of an unconventional approach to things. So if you can make it to the end, hopefully it'll all make sense. It may not at the beginning, but hopefully it will by the end. And with that, let me uh, share screens here. There we go. So it's 4th of July weekend. We call tomorrow Independence Day here in the United States. It's a day to celebrate freedom and independence. It seems fitting that we talk about freedom and independence, right? That's the theme. Let's start with a question. Start with an experiment. I like to do this. Are we free? And you're probably thinking, oh, what's this talking about on Sunday morning? But bear with me here. To answer that, let's do the experiment. So if I ask everyone to think of something, let's pick strawberries and cake. Can you picture that? You can, right? What if I show you a picture? It's even easier, right? Everybody can think of pic picture of strawberry and cake. We can think of anything that we can dream up. Now, however, do you have to think of strawberries and cake? Can I command you, anyone here, to think about what to think about? Are you compelled to, forced to, think about strawberries and cake? No. You can think about whatever you like. You can think about juicy, perfectly grilled hamburgers, toasted buns, and a slice of your favorite cheese on top. If you like, it's up to you. You can choose what you want to think about or do. I can do my best to get you to think about strawberries and cake by saying strawberries and cake several times, showing these pictures, these ripe, juicy strawberries, that delicious looking cake. If I say it enough, it's really hard not to think about it, isn't it? Think about strawberries and cake. The more times I say it, and the more you see it. Some of you may be thinking about that explosion of flavor in your mouth from sun wrapping strawberries in the peak season that brings you taste buds. How much better they are when they're paired with like the nice, delicious cake and frosting, right? I can influence your thoughts, my words and the pictures. But I can never force you to think about something, can I? You can tune me out. Some of you may do that. Please don't, but you could. You can think about your lunch, what you're going to do later today, when you read about the news, what you just read in the Bible, about the lyrics, the last song we sang. Lots of ways to think about what you want to and not what someone else is wanting you to think about. However, what if I told you what I really wanted you to think about was food? How many of you out there thought about food? Lots, right? See, there's a special weak spot that many people have. It's far enough from breakfast, it's close enough to lunch, and it's right there. And Sunday worship service happens to fall in that sweet spot. And, yeah, I took advantage of that. And it's a cheap shot, but it works, right? Now, I've even talked about some people's favorite things. Some tart, some sweet, some even salty. How many of you are looking forward to lunch more after this than we were before? Few, right? I know I am, but I like food, so that's easy. I'm, I'm an easy more. But it doesn't take much to get you to look forward to lunch, especially at a time like this. So with all that said, are we free? And I'd posit, yes, we are. It may not seem like it after you get tricked into something, but there are some out there that are doing just fine, saying to themselves, I don't like strawberries, I don't like cake or burgers, so I'm, I'm doing good. And that may be weird to some people, especially like me, I'm like, how do you not like that? But it's true. In an audience this size, I'm betting somebody out there didn't, wasn't affected by that at all. But it's being not tempted free. No, it just simply makes it easier to endure. What about those folks who had a really big breakfast, having to have snacks available, something to distract them, some gum to nibble on, and they're not really thinking about lunch? Well, that's a choice. And that's more along the lines of what we're going to talk about. A choice is made to prepare and distract yourself. What about those who skip breakfast, or are naturally hungry often, 
or who really, really like strawberries. I eat breakfast, but I'm in those latter two groups. When I was writing this, it actually, I wanted a snack. <laughs> so, am I free if the choice is really hard? And let's try a tactic about that. See if you can pull away from focus on food. What if you change cake to snake? And instead of strawberries and cakes, you're thinking of strawberries and snakes. But being out in the field, you're picking some strawberries, and you come across this big, mean rattlesnake with its tail just buzzing away. And that snake's all cold up and ready to strike. So they're not so hungry anymore, right? Now, the temptation can be really, really strong. We have a choice what to think about, what to do. We can choose to control ourselves and our thoughts. Now, I don't want everybody to leave for lunch too early, so let's shift away from food for just a moment. What do we know? We have choices. We have control of our minds. Even when it's really hard, we're never forced to think about something. If we start to think about it, we can always choose to change our thoughts, and direct them elsewhere. God gave us self-determination and choice. Every human since Adam and Eve has had choices to make. Those choices go beyond our thoughts. They extend to our actions. Choice means freedom. Having that choice means you have freedom. And when you have a choice, you have freedom because you can choose independence. Now, let's talk about independence for a moment. It's one of the other topics. Every child, we've all been kids, we have kids, every child can choose to stay or leave their parents. Now, as parents, we don't admit this, but it's true. Every child chooses to stay or leave. They could walk out the door. Now, when children are young, it's not advantageous to leave their parents, right? It's hard to provide for yourself. It's hard to, to get housing. But as they get older, if, we, if the adults have done their jobs as parents, the children will leave the house, they will start their own family, but hopefully won't leave what we've taught them as they grow up. So why did God give us a choice? Have you ever thought about why God gave us a choice in freedom? What if we were forced to love God? What if we were robots? Could we really call that love? Would that be a love? No, if you're were forced to marry someone and you had no choice in the matter, would that be a marriage of love? Now, it may grow to love over time. You may choose to love who you're with, but if you truly had no choice, there could truly never be love, could they? So let's turn to a scripture. Let's turn to 1 John 4, 7, and 8. I mean, if you may know this one. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. It begins in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Would God be a God of love if we were simply automatons, robots? No. We would simply be machines, things. We would never be his children. We'd only be his collection of things. More like a book of stamps or a rock collection instead of a large family, right? If we have no choice and if we love him or not, that's not real love. However, if we can choose God, can there be love? Yes, right? Let's flip that around. If we can choose to love God, can there be hate? Yeah, unfortunately, that is. It's one of the consequences of the freedom of choice. You can have both ways. Can a child run away from their parents? Yeah, it's their choice. They can walk out the door. However, if they run away from their parents, and the parents are good, and they're dependent on their parents, how does it work out for the kids? Not good, right? Homelessness, carver boxes, not so fun. It's not exactly what you want to end up with. What is our relationship with God, though? Do we depend on God? And is God good? Yeah! <laughs> we, 
penalty for everything. He's very, very good. That being the case, what if we choose to run away from God? How does that work out for us? It's not good, right? Life without God is pretty empty. It's void of meaning. It's, it's a waste of a life. Could we choose that path? Yeah. We can choose stupid. It's our choice. Now in our families, our children grow up. They become the parents. They start their own family. However, you ever hear reference in the Bible of the independent adult offspring of the Lord God? No, right? In our world, we cycle through things. Each generation gets to experience what it's like to be the child, what it's like to be the adult. God gave us these life experiences so we can understand. But do we ever become the adults in a relationship with the almighty creator of the universe? No. We can never attain the rank of creator. We are the creation. He is the creator. We cannot create the creator. It's kind of circular and a little bit ridiculous. So, if we're always dependent on God, and we're always the children in a relationship, can we ever say that we're truly independent? So, think about that. And I'm going to posit, yes, I believe we can. And we'll get to that. So, here's another experiment. Can you hold your breath? Can you refuse to eat? Can you try to live underwater without scuba gear? Sure, we can do all those things, right? You can. You might not want to, but you could. We depend on air and food to live. We don't have to partake in either of them if we don't want to. You can choose not to. Now, if that, now it is true, reality will set in. Your face will turn blue, either pass out or drown, but we can make that choice. As we mentioned before, we can freely choose stupid. It's, it's there. The choice is always there for us, and some people actually willingly choose that. They do. There is freedom to choose well, and freedom to choose, and we'll go with this term, much less than optimal, to be nice, choices. And let's turn to 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks about the situation, where he can make all sorts of choices. 1 Corinthians 10.23 1 Corinthians 10.23, it reads, All things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful to me, but not all things edify. But edify, he means build up, strengthening. So, let's turn to food once more time, just briefly. Let's get down to verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, 25 and 26. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord in all its fullness. Now, some of you may be going to a friend's house for a cookout or for dinner, and that's really good advice. Whatever they put on your plate, just eat it, don't ask questions, it's good. They gave it to you. Brief side story here. When I was dating my wife, I'd go over to her family's house, and she, her grandmother was this little bitty lady, spoke very little English, but she's a lovely lady. And one of her favorite things to do whenever we ate was to put something in front of me, and everybody would turn and say, is he going to eat that? And you know what? I may not know what it was. I may not know how to pronounce it, but I'd eat it. And it turns out a lot of it was really good food. Tini's family ate some really good food. I was lucky. Now, outside of medical exceptions, we have freedom when it comes to food, right? Food is not sinful. It's not the food that's doing anything to us. Now, back to what we were talking about before with independence and choices. What was sinful about the food that Paul was taking in? And that was because it was offered to idols. The food didn't do anything. The food was just food. However, the people who offered it to idols, they're the ones who sinned by worshiping a cheap substitute for God instead of the real God. It was in their hearts, not what was on their plates that mattered. Let's turn to Mark 7. Mark 7, beginning verse 18. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter the heart, 
but his stomach, and has eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts. And he goes on to list a whole list of evil thoughts. So food, it comes in, it goes out, doesn't affect your soul, right? The person's thoughts, their actions, that's what affects our soul. From within, out of the heart, that is what matters. Even though we can choose all things, not all things are good to choose. Remember the saying in Spider-Man? Is anybody a big fan of the Marvel comics? Remember what does Uncle Ben tell him before he dies? With great power comes great responsibility. We have the choice. We can choose all sorts of stuff. And it's a heavy weight to have choices, to live with true freedom. Because we can choose what we want to do. And further exploring the question of can we be independent if we depend on God? Let's look at some of the choices we can make. And let's look at sin. It is a choice, as you know, we've mentioned. So we'll come back to independence and dependence on God in just a moment. But let's talk for a moment about the choices and talk about sin. So sin is like that first experiment. We get tempted, right? But we can overcome it. It can seem like a really strong temptation. It can seem like impossible to avoid. How hard is it for everyone to concentrate? We've been talking about food for some time now, right? Everybody's wanting food. It can be pretty hard. And that experiment, it started out innocently, right? Just a simple thought experiment. No big deal. I'm not trying to, I'm not up to anything. The temptation came up several times. I kept saying the words over and over. It even showed a picture on the screen about them. I was not direct in what the real experiment was about. And I was really trying to think, think about food, not just strawberries and cake, right? I ran an experiment at many people's weakest time of the day for food, just before lunch, not just any lunch, Sunday lunch, family, on the holiday weekend, when there's grilled food, cookouts, good food, right? It's even harder on a day like today. They even made some of the foods that are likely to be consumed this weekend, summer fruits, some sweets, something off the grill. Yeah, it's a cheap shot. But that's like sin, isn't it, right? That's how it works. Sin takes cheap shots. It doesn't come at you when you're at your strongest, when it doesn't knock on your door and announce, hello, I'm sin, I'm here to tempt you. It doesn't do that, right? It sneaks up on you. It comes at you when you're most vulnerable, when emotions are making you not think clearly, when sin has a chance of getting you to partake. That's when it hits. But just like in that experiment, there's ways to avoid sin. There's different ways to choose not to partake. Just there are multiple ways to prepare ahead of time, distract ourselves, think about something else that came up, just like we did with that experiment. You can do things like that. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 10 for a moment. Verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. Get to verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. No matter what, God's going to give you an out, right? There's always that out. Like an experiment. Even at some pleasant something, something that you don't really like, like look, picture that rattlesnake, it's not fun. But it works, doesn't it? There are ways to pull our thoughts away from temptation, as long as we try to look for them. So let's recap. We have choices. We have freedom. Freedom means that we have to be prepared. We've got to be strong. We've got to be ready to face the challenges that comes with actually having freedom. So even though we can choose what is right, we can also choose the stupid. That is our God-given right. And why? God wants souls who get to know Him. He wants souls who go to love Him. He wants souls that, even though there's a whole realm of stupid to choose from, choose Him. That's what God wants. He wants people that are smart enough, strong enough to overcome it and to see what's reality and overcome all that's out there. Now, it should be a really easy choice. A no-brainer, right? 
Well, look around. How many people are here, online or in the building, versus how many people are outside doing something else? It's a big difference, right? Why do so many people choose stupid over God? Well, let's take this back to the topic of discussion, of independence, right? How can we be free when we're dependent on God? If we're always a children in the relationship with God, how does that work? And why is that a good choice? Well, let's look into it and find out. First off, what does it mean to be dependent on God? What exactly is that? To give our lives to Him, to submit ourselves to Him, to be His servants. What does that really mean? Well, we happen to have an instruction manual that's really handy, right? The Bible. Let's start way back at the beginning in Deuteronomy and see what they say beginning of that. Well, Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13, it reads, And now, Israel, what does the Lord require, Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. I notice that for your good. What this is saying is basically, it's expected that you know enough, understand enough about God to know that he is the Almighty, the existing one, the creator, the one who we owe all to. And give him some according respect, right? And notice the last part. Keep his commandments for our own good. That's key. Keep that in your head. In other words, listen to what your Heavenly Father tells you when it's not to do something because it's going to hurt you or somebody else, right? It's pretty simple. So what are those commandments that God gives us? Let's look into that. Let's take some verses to sum things up. And there's a few of those scattered throughout the Bible. Let's take one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, and let's go to our gold standard Jesus who sums it all up. Let's start back in the Old Testament with Micah. If you would turn to me or turn with me or look at the screen, either one. Micah 6 8. In Micah 6 8, it reads, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, what Micah says is worded a little bit differently. This is pretty much the exact same thing found in Deuteronomy 10. Do what God says, act justly, love mercy. Remember that you are God's child. Not the other way around. Walk humbly with God. It's the same message, right? Now, let's turn to the New Testament. James 1, 27. In the New Testament, James 1, 27 reads, Pure and undefiled religion before God, and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, is that any different? It's a little bit right. The only difference really is it starts with recognizing God as our Father and ends with doing what He says. Help others. Love others. Help those who need it. Still the same message. Taking care of those who need help sounds a lot like acting justly and love and mercy, doesn't it? Now, let's turn to our gold standard Jesus who sums everything up. We'll round this out and what it means to depend on God and be a servant. Turn to Matthew 22, 37 to 40. If anybody who's listened to my message before, you find out these verses are in almost every one of them. These are awesome. Matthew 27, 37 through 40. 37 it says, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These words, Jesus sums up the whole Bible in these few beautiful words, doesn't he? That's it. Love God, love the others. Now, if we love God and God loves us, is it harmful to depend on God? Is it bad? Is it wrong? Now, let's put that in context. I love my wife. 
She's back there with my children. I depend on her for many things. You can tell her, don't, you know. <laughs> many, many things I depend on my wife, Jeannie, for. For example, when scheduling things, I'm lost without Jeannie. She can keep her schedule, my schedule, all three kids' schedule in her head and keep them straight. And that's awesome. Is it harmful to depend on my wife for something like that? No. It's how married life works. That's part of it. We make each other better by helping each other out. That's what it's all about. From our side on our relationship with God, we can only offer God our choice and our love. But on the relationship with God, He can offer us so very, very much it's unbelievable, right? So it is a little bit lopsided. It's not exactly like a marriage, but you can still see how the dependence is not bad. Now, this is one of the paradoxes of being dependent on God. Dependence on God is reality. If you exist, you depend on God, whether you realize it or not. It just is. That's the way the world works. It's like breathing air. It's necessary for survival, whether we know it or not. However, realizing that we're dependent on God and embracing it, that leads to freedom. When you realize what really is, that's the freedom and independence. So back in Deuteronomy, when the verse states, for your good, that's key. Let's turn to verse Psalm 46. Now the scripture reading this morning was Psalm 47. And you remember how the, the, the tone of the scripture reading? God is awesome. Clap your hands. Sing to God. Why? And this kind of gives us that. Now, this is a lot up here, so bear with me for a moment. But if you read through this, this is really good. What about when you depend on God when it really counts? When things are really hard? When things are really, really troublesome? Let's look at that. And this is one of those times, Psalm 46, 1 through 11. Beginning in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just to the break of dawn. The nations raised, the kingdoms removed, he uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Who has made the desolations in the earth? He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, that passage, it starts freedom from fear and reinforces it time and time again, doesn't it? We live our lives like those, when we live our lives, and those times are like those roaring waters that are troubled, it's good to know that God is there, right? It's good to know we have a refuge. Verse 10, when God is speaking to us, when it turns from the basically talking about God to God speaking back, notice what he says. Be still and know that I am God. It's like God saying, chill, dude. You know who I am. I got this. Those words are so awesome, right? When things are so bad and you don't know where else to go, God's saying, I got you. I'm there for you. That is what Deuteronomy, Micah, James, the pastor Jesus comes with the whole Bible, Matthew, that's what they're talking about. Realizing who God is, trusting in Him, and doing what He tells us for our own good. Embracing that dependence on God means independence from all the things that are not for our good. We get independence from sin, from death, that's true freedom. 
We depend on God because we exist in the universe. But that dependence, once you realize and embrace, these dependence from worry, from fear, from doubt, from harming ourselves, from harming others, and all things that are not for our good. Realizing what reality is and living a life with God and for God leads to freedom and independence from all the crazy that happens in this life. Now, does crazy still happen? Yeah, we're still in this world, right? It still happens here in this realm of existence, but we can be still, know that He is God, and be free from panic and worry about what's going to happen. Because when we forget about God and who He is, that's when we start to really lose it. When we remember who He is and what He's there for, who, what He can do for us, that's when you can make it through. The day we realize who God is and make the choice to serve Him, that is our real independence day. We become independent of the sin of this world. And we can be truly free to live who we actually are. Beloved children of the Most High God. And that's a nice position. That's really a good place to be. And that's why we're talking about this. Are we free? Yes. Do we have choices? Yes. Can we depend on, be independent of God? No. But can we have true independence from what matters? All the things that harm us? Yes. So, that's when we talk about freedom and independence. That's the time of freedom and independence we talk about. And if you celebrate this weekend, we do have the independence of the nation, and that's awesome. But remember the independence that God gives us, the freedom that God gives us, because that, more than any nation, more than anything here on this earth, that's the truly awesome gift that God gives us, that salvation. So, if you realize who God is, and you want that independence, the freedom, the love that comes with the life of God, now or any time is a great time to be baptized and join God's family. The day you make that choice will truly be your independence day and lead you to a life of incredible freedom. If you'd like to be baptized, or if you have any other need you'd like to bring for the congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. Thank you.